Welcome to the Payday with Ray Ray podcast, hosted by yours truly, Rachel Bell. I'm here to make your life easier as an entrepreneur and teach you everything I've learned about building multiple seven-figure online businesses. And on this podcast, I'll be giving you my best advice, trainings, and mindset shifts so you can grow your business and most importantly, make every day your payday. Oh, hey, what's up? Welcome to episode number one, the first ever episode of Payday with Ray Ray. (sighs) Welcome in, kick off your shoes, get comfortable. Do you need a drink? Do you need a beverage? Do you need anything? Go and get yourself one. This episode, the first episode, is brought to you by none other than Online Coach University. (laughs) That's right. It's my own company. I'm my own damn sponsor because I'm the captain of this ship. Um, But I wanted to take a quick moment to tell you about OCU. For those of you who are new listeners and new members of the family here at Payday with Ray Ray and the Ray Ray Vortex, as we call it. Online Coach University is my online education company for coaches who want to start, grow, and scale their businesses. And if you have been following me for more than two seconds, you already know that we have a signature 90-day business accelerator program called Online Coach Accelerator. And it's the most popular program that we offer. And it teaches you all about how to find your niche, craft your irresistible offer, create content that sells, how to have five-star relationships with your clients, and how to sell with confidence and authenticity so that you don't feel slimy or pushy on your sales calls. We talk about audience monetization, and we teach you how to get your first clients and hit those 10K months all through social media alone. So if you have not heard of that yet and you are interested and that seems like something that you could benefit from, go ahead and check out more information over at the website, which is onlinecoachaccelerator.com. So that's all. That's a sponsor. (laughs) My first sponsorship. So let's talk about the episode that's coming up right now. Jay Abraham. This is the guest. He is something else. This man is kind of a unicorn in so many different ways. And I've been following his work for years and years and years. He's an OG, an original gangster when it comes to marketing. And he's known as the $21 billion man. That's right. That's billion with a B. Biatch. And he's worked in over a thousand industries. So obviously he has an extensive range of knowledge and insight and wisdom, regardless of what niche or industry you might be in. And because of that, he has become the go-to expert for so many of the world's top business icons like Damon John. If you've ever watched a Shark Tank, you know exactly who that guy is. And if you're in personal development in that industry, you've probably heard of Tony Robbins, which is another big fan of Jay Abraham. So Jay is basically the granddaddy of marketing. He's the guy that everyone looks up to. And I got the amazing opportunity to sit down with him for a couple hours, which was mind blowing to say the least. But one thing I really, really dig about Jay's style is that he talks about principles and the immutable laws of marketing, not just tactics and shiny objects that we see everyone else talking about on Instagram. And when I first discovered Jay, my first introduction to him, I was actually working at a virtual assistant company. That's right. I used to be a VA. I used to do graphic design, copywriting, sales funnels, building out the back ends of people's businesses, trying to make ends meet and trying to get my own business off the ground in the background. And everyone was like, oh my God, you have to listen to Jay Abraham. He's the best. And I was like, okay, I will. And so I tried to listen to all of his material and so much of it was pure gold. I actually had a hard time absorbing half of it because it was so dense and so valuable. And I knew that it was valuable, but I couldn't figure out how to apply it to myself. And just so you have an idea of what this man's time is worth, the investment to spend around eight hours with Jay and like have a full day of consulting is is over $120,000. Yeah. That's like goals right there, huh? And two hours with him is 70K. So if you wanted to hook up a J, get some business advice, that is your investment. And when someone's time is worth that much, you definitely want to make sure that you're maximizing every single second. But what happens is sometimes when we're in front of someone that we know can help us or we're in front of someone that we know their wisdom can really, really impact the direction of our lives and our businesses, we don't know what to ask. We don't know exactly how to extract the wisdom that we need. We don't know the right questions to ask. And one of the best things I ever learned from Jay in the beginning was that if you don't know how to define your problem, you will not be able to find a solution. So one thing that I used to do every day or every week when I was starting to grow my business and trying to figure out how I could scale 
is I would pretend like I had a meeting every Friday with Jay and it would motivate me to get really, really clear on my problems and my business. And I would sit down and say, okay, what's the number one problem in my business? If Jay was literally in front of me right now, what would I want to ask him to maximize my business growth? And when you ask yourself those types of questions, you get very, very different answers than just going throughout your day, floating around, not really sure what to do. But when you invest time into finding clarity and what's holding you back, amazing things happen. So that alone, that little nugget alone, changed the trajectory of my life. Because now whenever I feel like something's off, I actually take time to process and journal and write out what are the problems and what are the solutions that I actually need to implement in order to make a difference. So during this episode, my main takeaway from this time with Jay was the difference between tactics and strategies. So like I said, when I first started consuming Jay's teachings, some of it went straight over my head because I had to learn the hard way instead. I was like, oh, this is about mindset. This is about thinking, but I'm really, really looking for the shortcut. And when you're at the beginning of your business, shortcuts are really easy to focus on. And sometimes you don't want to focus on the mindset. You don't want to focus on the principles. You just want that one sales script that's going to make the difference for you or that one template for an Instagram caption or a webinar outline that's going to make you 100K or the magical sales funnel recipe. And everyone's trying to sell you one piece of the puzzle, right? And it's not wrong to learn all the pieces of the puzzle, but it does take way more than just one piece of the puzzle to become successful. And looking back on my time when I was learning from Jay, I understand everything he says now, and I want to emphasize how important it is to really, really pay attention to the way that he thinks and the way that he structures his information around principles that never change instead of just giving tactics and shiny objects, because those are a dime a dozen. Obviously, you can look up any shiny little tactic on Pinterest or Instagram or Google and find what you're looking for. But when it comes to the wisdom that someone gains through experience, you really can't Google that. And I want you to pay attention to the way that he packages all of his learnings and teachings into principles. And additionally, another distraction that happens when you're at the beginning of your business and you're trying to scale, you're trying to grow, is sometimes it's more digestible or it seems more digestible to learn from people who are at your level, right? Like Becky, who's an Instagram business and life coach, and you know she's doing her thing on Instagram, posting about hashtags and stuff like that, seems like a better thing to focus on because it's easier. But please don't be mistaken. If you want to make quantum leaps in your life and in your business, you need the wisdom of people who are doing things that you can barely comprehend or keep up with. And that's why having an opportunity to sit in on a conversation with someone like this is so valuable. So Basically, when I went to go interview Jay, we went up to Los Angeles. I live in San Diego right now. So we drove up to LA and his office is, (laughs) it's obscure. It's a vibe. You walk in, there's a disco ball. There's plaques hanging on the walls, all these gifts from people like bobbleheads of Jay. There's like paintings of Jay, like all these different things. And it was really, really, really incredible to see how many people he's impacted by the sheer number of little memoirs and gifts that he's been given. And his legacy really, really stands out. So during the interview as well, I was sitting down, I was talking to him and there were certain times where I was like, oh my God, like if I had learned this three years ago or four years ago, I wonder where I'd be today. And if I had not only just heard this and learned this, but if I had actually lived by these rules, I would probably be in a much different slash better situation than I am today. It just goes to show the power of mentorship. And by the end of this episode, I hope you fall in love with Jay just as much as I have. And the amount of value that he's given me just through his free material has been absolutely insane. And legacy is actually his current theme right now in his life. And it's something that's very important to him. We actually talk about it just a little bit at the end of the episode. And he wants to pass on his wealth of knowledge to others and younger generation. So it's really up to us to take what he says seriously and apply it to our businesses. Because let's be honest, social media platforms will change like the wind. But these principles of marketing and business and client satisfaction and all these things really, really play a critical role in the longevity of your business. If you want to be self-employed, it's not something that's going to last 90 days and then you're out. (laughs) Like it's not a set it and forget it game. It's an ongoing life journey. It's a spiritual journey. It's something that you can use as a vehicle for your personal development. So taking what our mentors say seriously is absolutely paramount. So if you learned something from this episode and you want to share it, go ahead and post your favorite quote from Jay up to Instagram, tag me in it so I can show him. 
And there is a portion of the episode where he stands up and he shakes my hand in three different ways. And you'll you'll understand what I'm saying once you get into the episode. But when that happens, just picture him making the handshake increasingly more memorable. He's maximizing the handshake. <laughs> so without further ado, I hope that that gives you a clear picture into why I brought Jay onto the podcast and why I'm so stoked for you to learn from him, just like I did in the beginning of my business journey. There's so much gold nuggets in here. Sometimes he would say something and I would just respond with thank you <laughs> because I know like how valuable what he's saying is because I've seen it become so true in my business growth journey. And I, a lot of those things I had to learn the hard way. So don't be like me. Don't learn the hard way. Learn from strong, secure, wise, and experienced mentors that truly know what the fuck is up. You know what I'm saying? So without any further ado, like I said, Jay is on the podcast. Enjoy the episode. Jay, uh, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Oh, this come on, it's my pleasure. Ray. And I am so excited to talk to you. I'm excited to talk to you. Thank you. But from the beginning, I was fascinated by this concept of you being the whatever multi-billion dollar man, the father of marketing. <laughs> Everyone hypes you up. They're like, Jay is the man that I go to for advice. So I listened to a bunch of your podcasts. I tried to absorb some of the, your material when I first got started and then nothing really clicked with me because okay. it's like everything is... You know, it's all about mindset. I want the tactics. I want the and, blueprint to success, you know? And, and that is, unfortunately, what a lot of tactical salespeople would mm. make the market believe they need. Exactly. And that's exactly what I thought I needed was the tactics or the webinar strategy or yeah, whatever yeah, it was yeah. to get ahead. So the more I dive into business and the more that I learn and get humbled, the more I realize how priceless your lessons are. So it's a total that's so honor. Nice. Thank you. Yeah, it's an honor to talk to you. And I really appreciate your time. But <laughs> Tell that to my wife. <laughs> we'll do. Maybe not, I'm not the best person to say that. <laughs> so I have an audience of younger people. Great. Yeah. And I find that it's hard for me to explain exactly what it is you do in a short sentence about your track record, okay. what you've done, how you work with people <clears throat> in a way that the average 20 or 30 year old person can understand. I know that's a big task. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. It is, but it's something that when I say Jay Abraham, a lot of people are like, well, I know who he is, but I don't really see any content from him on social media, which is my language, right? Yes. So it's almost like I need to bridge the gap and explain mm -hmm. a little bit more about where it is you come from and who sure. you are. So how would you explain yourself to someone like me? We've gone through iterations. In the beginning, I didn't say this, so it's not arrogant or mm -hmm. egotistical, but I was identified as a marketing genius because I was able to come up with a lot of breakthroughs. And then I became more of a masterful strategist. Then I became an ultimate business builder. Then I became what's called a masterful thinking partner. And each of those iterations was a more expansive way of working with more the totalistic or holistic part of a business, not just one facet, but the mindset, the strategy, mm -hmm. the business model, the value proposition, the competitive advantage, the preemptive advantage, all kinds of different components, and even figuring out all kinds of monetization for people that didn't buy or people that stopped buying. And just for clarification, I'm an anomaly. It's very hard to classify me, so it's very difficult. And it's mm. been a gift and a bane. Mm. It's a bane because people go, well, I don't understand how you can help me. It's a gift because I've helped in a very long career over a thousand industries, not businesses. So when you get the privilege of helping over a thousand industries, not businesses, on five continents, which I've been able to do, and I'm just saying that clinically, okay. I've had a long career, and most of them are not online information mm -hmm. marketers, they're the whole gamut, technology, not high tech, low tech, no tech, mm -hmm. manufacturing, distribution, professional services. You get to see literally hundreds of different strategy models, mm -hmm. hundreds of different revenue models, hundreds of different ways to generate prospects, hundreds of different ways to convert prospects, hundreds of different ways to expand the lifetime value, hundreds of different mm -hmm. ways to add value. And what I've been very good at is a combination of what I call funnel vision versus tunnel vision, mm -hmm. borrowing all kinds of elements from all kinds of industries and combining them into massively powerful hybrids that people doing things the same way 
in the same industry don't even know about and it gives them advantage. And uh, you talked about Tony Robbins. I think he would say that I'm very, very beyond good and it's just a clinical assessment, not Mm -hmm. arrogance, in what's called pattern recognition. Mm -hmm. Seeing something and being able to correlate it or relate it or extrapolate it to something else that I've done in my life and borrow from that and add great advantage. I don't know if that helps you. Oh yeah, no. I can look at all kinds of things with a with a mindset that's it's like everything's a three D movie. Yes, good news. It's a rare gift. It was hard won. It wasn't always that fun. I've got a very, you know, very uh, painful background, but it's given me an advantage. But Mm. it's something that I can't duplicate. So Mm. I charge a lot because I'm the only one who can do it. But I don't have twenty other people doing it. I have have you know a hundred coaches and things like that. So it's a really interesting sort of a conundrum. And I'm imagining peanut butter toast with jelly toast <laughs> and you putting them together and making a beautiful peanut butter and well, jelly toast yeah, sandwich. It's, That's it's, it, it's, right? I'm, I'm really a catalyst. Right. And the combination of the hybrids, that concept is something that no beginners really think of because they just think of the blueprint and the framework, like I mentioned earlier. Yes. They're like, well, this person's doing this, so I need to do that. But one of the things that I've learned from you that's helped me so much in my marketing is to break out of the rigidity of the way that you think currently and look at other industries and other parallels that's so wonderful. that you can borrow that's from great. them and put that's a very, It's very thrilling to hear that from a young person because mm. that gives you, it gives you multiple advantages. One advantage is strategy, and marketing, and most people are tactical. You talk about, mm. they want, it's an aside, because I have a real complaint with all the people that sell tactics. Mm. These poor young people, and, and older people that are trying to get second incomes, mm-hmm. they'll get they'll get marketing from somebody, advertising, and they'll be about a new launch theory, or a new Instagram theory, yep. and they'll go, oh, I'm gonna buy that tactic. And they don't realize that the person selling it is not trying to sell just you that tactic. They want to sell 100,000 of you. So even if the tactic works, which usually was something that worked before because that person's not doing it anymore, so it's it's an almost obsolete already. If 100,000 of you have it, the tactic becomes marginalized anyhow, and now you need a new tactic. A new tactic, exactly. And That's why never I thought win. the new algorithm update, the new yeah, this, it, the new course. never win that Exactly. Way. That's why I try to get every... Most small business owners, young, old, they're tactical, they're not strategic. Hmm. When you make that shift alone, it changes everything. Can we dive into that? Because I think that's a really interesting distinction between being tactical and being strategic. Mm -hmm. So what would you say is the distinction when you think about someone's day-to-day behavior in their business, the way they think about their business, what what separates those two? I haven't talked about this for a long time, but I'll dust off the catacombs of my mind and give you some stories, okay? Awesome. So this will be good. First of all, I talk about strategy is the big long-term integrative game your business is playing, the ongoing permanent game you're playing. It can be adjusted, but a tactic is nothing more than a driver of that. Hmm. People who just do intermittent, you know, episodic, different tactics, they're just throwing mud on the wall. It's, that's the equivalent. Mm. The way I address it, I'm going to tell you a story. It'll take a little while, but when I tell it, usually, dusting it off, if I tell it right, it'll blow your viewers' minds. It's that cool. Years ago, this is not going to be an online, but it's totally applicable. So years ago, I had two friends who were very different marketers. One was a very gifted copywriter, but he was very tactical. The other was a good copywriter, but he was a brilliant strategist. Mm. Talented copywriter, tactical, good copywriter, strategist. So the talented copywriter got this idea when they first introduced artificial diamonds, cubic zirconium, that he would come up with a way of selling a loose one. And so he created something called the Beverly Hills Diamond Company, wrote a fabulous full page ad. Back when newspaper was very viable, he ran it on the front of the Los Angeles Times Sunday, one of the sections. It cost him twenty five thousand. It brought in about forty with a credit card charges, discounts, refunds. He made about nine, and that wasn't enough to excite him. Mm. So he stopped, threw in the towel. Friend two, who was not as good a copywriter, but was a brilliant strategist, and he was selling a one carat loose cubic zirconium that he called the Beverly Hills Diamond. 
Mm-hmm. Friend two watched it and thought strategically, that's pretty cool. The other guy thought that's not very lucrative. Right. Other friend thought it was cool and he wasn't as good a copywriter. He wrote a full page ad. He came up with a company he called Van Pliss and Tissany, which was a uh, a take on Van Cleve and Arpel. You people might not know, but it's a real high end jeweler in New York and Tiffany's. He came up with the Van Pliss diamond, which was how he explained his loose one carat diamond. He ran the same kind of ad, which was decently written, but not like the others, in the same front page of a section in the LA Times on a Sunday, cost the same 25 grand. His did not pull 40 grand. His only pulled about 30 Mm. after everything, discounts, refunds, costs. He lost four grand. Now, at that point, you'd go, well, that doesn't sound very good, right? I go back to friend one. Mm -hmm. who was the gifted copywriter, tactical. When he sold his Beverly Hills loose diamond, he just took this cubic zirconium, artificial diamond. It was $39, by the way. Stuck it in a little corrugated box, stuck that in an envelope, little note, and sent it out. Friend two took his loose one carat $39 stone, put it in a velvet jeweler's bag, put that in a simulated little wooden box, Mm -hmm. put that in a really nice bigger envelope with two documents. The first one was a letter from him. The document said, as the president of Van Plis and Tissany, I am so delighted to deliver to you your one carat loose Van Plis diamond. Mm. But before you take it out, I want to alert you. First, you're going to be staggeringly stunned in the most positive way because of its brilliance, its fiery, electrical look, its magical sort of, uh, he just all these cool words. He said, but you might, when you take it out, be a little bit disappointed because you might think that we deserve you because it might not look as large as you think. It's not in any way that we did you a disservice, but in order to get that kind of fiery brilliance and beauty and all the excitement, it has to be heavier, it's more dense, Mm. so it's a little smaller. When our clients see how magnificent and beautiful the Van Plus diamonds are, almost all of them contact us, excuse me, contact us, and ask if we can send them and sell them a five or 10 or 20 carat diamond that they can put into earrings or Mm. necklaces. And we found that when we did that, they'd go to their jeweler and they would charge them an arm and a leg to set it. And because we are a manufacturing jeweler also, we have taken the time to create collections of five, 10, 20 carat Van Plus diamonds set in earrings, necklaces, and you'll see them in the catalog that accompanies this. And if you are someone who would like to get a larger stone, we want to reward you for your blind trust. So we will give you double credit for your $39 payment if you want to send it back and pick any items in this catalog. And to make it easier, we've included return, UPS, everything else here. So friend one, brilliant copywriter, crappy strategist, Mm -hmm. tactician, made $9,000 on the front end and gave up. Mm -hmm. Friend two lost about $3,000 on the front end, but because he was strategic, he made $25 million in year one. That's the difference between being strategic Mm. and tactical. Does that help? That helps tremendously. So even though it was not online, I can give you lots and lots. Like, so we used to do masterful. I mean, today you think of an affiliate program. That's so superficial compared to the stuff that we have done. We've done billions of dollars of power partnering, strategic alliances, but they're very integrative. When we would do it, for example, I did one one time with a gold brokerage company. We became the recommended provider for 25 financial newsletters. Every time someone would subscribe to the newsletter, they would get our material along with the welcome kit. We paid to be able to put out four issues every year of a newsletter on hard assets, which are what gold is. We would fund under the name of the newsletter, regional programs on hard money investing where we'd have a a celebrity or an iconic 
economists and we would be, give all the profit to our partner because we wanted access to the market. When their mailing pieces stopped working because most newsletters were selling a $100 item and they were lucky to break even on acquisition, you understand that. Mm -hmm. They made it on renewal and on other services. When they stopped making money and they stopped mailing, we would take over and we would underwrite it because if you were doing lead generating for an expensive product like gold, you're willing to spend two or $300 yeah. on a lead. They were losing, if they started losing $10, they'd stop. We were tickled pink to lose $10 to get access to their buyers. So it's just a different way of thinking. Yeah, That's right. being strategic. Most right. people do an affiliate. By the way, every offering we made with every different partner was unique as opposed to having the same stupid email that everybody sends one or two times to the same list and it's dumber than heck. And it's just a very big, but that's being tactical. Does mm, that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. It's having the long term. We did billions vision. of dollars, and and the affiliates go, oh, we did this great deal, and we gave away my used Toyota, and we did a million dollars. But when it's all done, they made five hundred grand, and they can't do anything else for. It's just there's two different ways of thinking. Mm. Most people, unfortunately, have been taught to be tactical. Mm. Hope that helps. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And that actually brings me to one of my most burning questions for you, which is, as a young person, I'm a digital native. I've never known a day without the internet. Okay. And so I partially was raised by the internet. All right. Uh, there's a couple amazing gifts that come with that. It's ease of usage. I understand technology. I feel comfortable with it. That's why I'm able no, to use it. I admire that because I get intimidated. Yeah, it's exciting for me. It's really, I'm curious about it all the time and I'm able to use it with ease. There's also some non-gifts that come with it as well, which is such things like attention span yes. and immediate gratification being so accessible now with the yeah. internet that it's almost like I'm consciously training my brain and my mind and my character to be anti-social media. I think in it's terms really of how impressive, I, and it's going to give you great advantage. I'm curious to ask you more about what you believe is the core building blocks in your life of patience, because you've been doing this for a very long time. And I imagine that when you first started, you had less patience than you True. do right now. We had so, more economic need, which, yes, and more ego acknowledgement need. Yes. And when you need those two, you have to push harder and faster. Once you get it, and you realize it's not going to change your life that much, and over a certain point, it's it's just incremental. And then you move to a, playing a long game. So talking about the long game yes. is really, really important to me as I continue to build my vision and as I continue to teach my own students, you know, you can't just be in this for the next 90 days, even yeah. though that's as long as the program is. Yes. You have to be in this for a lifetime. If you want to be an entrepreneur, this is a lifelong that's journey. That's a wonderful gift that you're doing for them. So what is your question? My question is, when it comes to thinking about the long term, what is a couple questions you ask yourself about how to create the vision that you want to go towards now, because you've been doing this for such a long time. And you mentioned in your documentary, you've had three midlife crises. Yeah. And I imagine during those times, you watch it. It's cool, isn't it? It's the coolest. I yeah. yeah, it's funny to make entrepreneurs look cool, but they definitely did a yeah, good job. A with it. job. <laughs> well, he's an 11 time Emmy award winning guy. Oh, that's he, awesome. So when it comes to building the long game for yourself at this point now in your career, if you could go back in time to your first big win in business or your first midlife crisis, or your yes. first turning point, what would you tell yourself about how to build your vision for the future so that you stay focused on the long game? Well, I think there's a couple of things, and I think a lot of young people don't have it. First of all, you need balance. Hmm. You need to have your life in alignment. I think the more in touch you are with humanity, the more humility you have, the more humanity you have, and the more external interest you have in the human condition, the more powerful you are. Everybody I look at, I realize is somebody's you know, son, daughter, husband, wife, father, mother, and I look at them, they're having this wonderfully unique life other than I. No two people are ever having the same reality. They don't even understand the same thing. The first thing I try to do about everyone is try to examine, evaluate, appreciate, recognize what their life is like, what their reality is like when I'm trying to work with a client to focus on their target audience, mm. what their values are, because no, nobody's values are always the same, their definitions are the same, what their life is like. I had a client one time that was a, it was a litigation attorney and he only did a certain kind of personal injury, but he wouldn't take a client until he'd lived in their house with them for three days over a weekend to appreciate what it was like to be in their plight, to have their injury and the way it 
it affected negatively their life. He wanted em- empathic respect. Most people don't have a clue in in online marketing. No disrespect. They are very yeah. superficial. Yeah. You know, they use buzzwords and bullets. Mm-hmm. They have no appreciation for what the real mindset is of their audience, the lives of their audience, mm-hmm. the hopes, the dreams, what their days are like. I try to really appreciate that. My wife gets really mad at me because on Sundays, I read the obituaries and I don't read the celebrity ones. I read the ones about the, you know, the woman who was involved in the PTA or the Cub Scouts because they were relevant. Everyone is relevant. I mean, you've seen the work I've done, I hope, on uh, the strategy of preeminence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's one of the things that took me forever to wrap my head around. It's hard, but when you get it, it's it's liberating. Yeah. It's probably the most wonderful elevating factor and accelerating factor in achievement and joy that you could ever have. But I really appreciate human beings. Mm. I appreciate the differences. I don't think any two people, I don't think anybody is less relevant. I think that the janitor is just as important as the CEO or the hedge fund manager. And when you don't think you're better than anyone and you realize that everyone has perspective, you can appreciate. And when you realize that you're selling to all these people, you better understand how differently different people see life and that, you know, and what their values are, what their hopes are, their dreams, their fears. I don't think most people really get that. They just get a collection of rhetoric that seems to work. And I was very early in infomercials because I go back a long time. When infomercials first started, you could do and say almost anything and people were gullible enough mm. and impulsive enough that they would respond. When internet marketing first started you could mm-hmm. throw any bullet and any any hype you wanted and people yeah. would buy today because of competition mm-hmm. because of alternative means you can get all kinds of information free you have to really know what value means if you don't know what value means and you're frustrated because you're not making money i mean it's it's, it's no secret really it's mm. it's no different today you have a different media yeah and it's interesting and you're right attention is different so you have to decide, how do I command quality attention? Mm-hmm. How do I win enough of your trust that you will invest in me the most precious thing you have, which is time mm-hmm. and focus? Mm-hmm. Because without that, it doesn't matter if they hit your your website or they go to your link or they opt in. Does it really? Of course It doesn't not. matter. Yeah. It's, it's moot. Yeah. But people don't, they think their judgmental criteria is wrong. I always default to quality over quantity. Mm-hmm. When, I, when I'm going to have a relationship with somebody, business, or I'm vicariously doing it for a client, our attitude is it's only a matter of time before the people we want to do business with will, if we invest first in them mm. and we win their trust and we win their attention. I think the world... And I think most marketers have what I call attention deficit. They're not getting the attention from Uh people. And there's a reason. If you're not getting the results you want, you're not getting the sales you want, you're not getting the resales you want, you're not getting the upgrade you want, you're not getting the time on your whatever you want. I mean, whose fault is it? Right. It's that you're basically not, you're not providing enough value mm. there's a there's a, th- a thread in all of marketing and all of life that young people if they got this or they get this they'll be very empowered reason why everything ultimately defaults to what's the reason why mm-hmm. we've been working on a project for two years that i hope i finish sometime <laughs> with with a partner and the working title of it and i've got lots of books but this is pretty interesting it's called relevancy rules yes. and it's a double entendre on the one hand, it's making a declaratory statement that the whole foundational font in all of our lives today flows from the level of relevancy you have related to the different categories of people you have to interact with. Mm. The other is here's rules for being relevant. But mm-hmm. it looks at things like the networks you have, not networking, but you mm-hmm. have different networks. You have, you have business networks, you have, you have collegial networks. Mm-hmm. It looks at how valuable your, I mean, it looks at what kind of response you get. Uh, I'll give you another strategic concept. I'm getting ADD on you, but it's sort of fun. (laughs) So 
I'm I have a philosophy. That. We've just been working a lot of always new philosophies. Yeah. And the working title is beyond taking your business beyond exponential. This could be very interesting. And some of your analytic and, and mathematically oriented programming type, your clients or your, or your followers will, will enjoy this. So I've done 30 or 40 categories in my life. I've identified each one of which can make a real business grow geometrically. And I always thought, well, geez, geometry times geometry times geometry, it should be some outrageously, you know, multiplied whatever. And I never took the time to look it up, and I did. And in fact, mathematically, there are five gradients you can take performance above exponentiality. Hexation, pentation, octation, there's five yeah. of them. If you could take everything you do well beyond exponential, why in the world would you do anything in your life incremental. Hmm. And I started thinking about that. And we started really taking a look at everything anybody does that has impact. Mm -hmm. I'm jumping around, but I'm gonna show you something, okay? Yeah, yeah. All right, so okay. put your thing down, stand up. Okay, you're taller than I am. I'm a little tall. Well, everyone's taller than I am. But <laughs> so pretend like we just met, shake right. my hand. Howdy do, Jay. It's a pleasure meeting you, now you put too. it down. Now, that's the typical way a linear-minded person, not criticizing you, would engage in the first year of a relationship, right? Right. It, do it again. All right. How are you? Hey, Jay, how, oh, that's new. And which one is gonna have more Impact. retention? Right here. And you're gonna think about it. Yep. Okay, do it again. Hey, how are Jay. you? Good, how are you? Now, did any of those yeah. take more time? Nope. But. The last two have a lot more lasting impact, don't yes, you think? Yes, Which one's more strategic? Definitely hand on the shoulder. So that's just one thing. So sit down, I'll tell you one more thing. I'm just trying to show you how to think. Yeah, before. absolutely. Actually, Unless, when I first meet people, normally what I do is I do this. Hi, Jay, nice to meet you. And that's first cool. We're just gonna do a little. Okay, but, okay, and that's very <laughs> well, but good for you. Right. But most people don't. Right, exactly. Most people just go default to status quo, yeah. thinking, and action. Yeah. And that's a linear. So mm. in any endeavor anyone does that has as a coefficient needing to connect with somebody on the phone, most people are shocked when they get voicemail. Mm. I'm thinking, why would you be shocked? Mm -hmm. There's a 95% probability you're going to get voicemail. And if you don't, there's a 95% secondary prob probability you're going to get a gatekeeper. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So why be shocked? Oh, if I go, oh, it says J. Abraham, go, call me back at uh, one, two, three, five, 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 one, two, one, two. What are the odds you're going to do that? Yeah. So if you know that you're probably going to get voicemail and you have a very provocative and evocative message that you leave that is designed to add value, stimulate, and produce a response, there's probably a 10 to 100 time higher chance. Plus, if you're going to leave the message Frequently, you want to think you're having a conversation with somebody and leave progressive. That's just thinking differently. Yeah. I can go out there with lots of it, but this goes back to relevancy. And most people don't, they don't think about all this, but all these things are factors that get you thinking about your relationship with whatever segments of the market you deal with mm -hmm. or your life mm -hmm. very differently. And I love that you're bringing the focus back to the human on the other end of the transaction. That's the big problem, I think, with a lot of young people, mm. a lot of online marketers, is they really, I mean, the idea of being connected is a joke. Yeah. I mean, I have a very famous colleague. He's the top specialist. He's, he's, he's a doctor in dealing with high-performing entrepreneurs. About 80% of them are going to be 80 to 88 HD, because they're just, that's part of their creativity, genius, but they're also driven and they're lopsided. I'm one of them. And he says the biggest problem that they and young people have is a lack of vitamin C. And the C he's talking about is real connectivity, mm -hmm. not me sending you a text or not me, you know, showing you a picture of me at dinner with somebody or with some celeb, but me basically having a human interaction with you. Mm -hmm. Also, nobody out there knows how to listen. Mm. They don't know how to acknowledge that they heard. It's, it's, and those little elements transform the effect you can have, not just on others, but the effect it'll have on you. See, the problem is I don't think a lot of people are really having a good time. 
I agree with you. And the lack of communication or the lack of communicative tools that I think most people have as well is preventing them from feeling that connection. And I've noticed a direct correlation between the better I become with humans, the more I love humans, the more I genuinely want to know about humans' lives, other humans, my customers, my clients, my students, my colleagues, the better I become at marketing. And the more connected and attracted they are to you and the more trust they have. Exactly. And it's so easy to hide behind the screen nowadays, especially with my generation. It's very much like, hey, I'll just post this selfie and hopefully clients come running to me. But there's but, no basis to it. Exactly. Now, I met, you're not going to ask me about this, mm. but I'm going to offer it to you. I've had the great privilege of working with three or 400 of the top experts in all kinds of categories of performance enhancement in life. And a couple of them are really interesting because they do soft skills. Mm. For example, we talked about trust. There's a gentleman named Stephen M. R. Covey. He's the son of a very famous, now deceased person who wrote a book called Seven Habits of High, mm-hmm. Highly Effective People. Young people won't know it, but it was one of the greatest books of all time. It still is. And the son, who's about my age, is the world expert on business trust building. He has broken business trust down to 13 characteristics. And if you can authentically possess and express and manifest authentically those 13. He has analyzed you can triple your effectiveness, triple your success, triple your sales. There's another woman, her name's got a funny name, Sally Hogshead. Oh, I she love is, her. She, she's great. Yeah. She's done work on being fascinating. But yeah. really what that means is how the world sees you. Yes. And she's done the same thing. She's got data that shows you do it one way and you get X, you do it another, you get 300%. Mm. Same time, same effort, same interaction. There's another person named Roger Love. He's a master at strategic (laughs) voice communication. He knows how the world hears you. And he's done the same thing. Three, four times more impact doing it one way than the other. Mm. Each one of these is separate. So the same thing I said, beyond exponential. 300, 300, 400, that kind of power has always been, will always be, and is available this moment for anyone who wants to transcend the mental miasma of their current existence. This piece of minutia, but it's sort of cool, isn't it? It's really cool. It's yeah, like one of you. the coolest things ever. And Sally Hogshead's work was one of the first things that I learned about when it came from two personality assessments. Isn't she great? She's the best. And my assessment came back as the rock star. Okay. And when I was reading it, it was like, wow, this is really how the world views me as opposed to how I operate in the world, yes. which was such a different way of viewing personality. And bringing that into business, like you mentioned, the trust factor going up, that's What I've noticed, the number one determining factor between my most successful students and the people who are still struggling, they know how to build trust because they just want to help people genuinely. It's almost like they're not even in it for the money. They want to just be in it for the mission. that is the secret. The secret is when you do something first and foremost for the impact and outcome, it, not you, but it will make on the other. Hmm. You're, You're... your strength, your posture, your your impact, your own will be multiplied. When you do it for your own self-interest or to make money, that's, you'll see a lot of people that started out very admirable and then they started getting a taste of blood and they just grew and grew and grew and they mm. lost total track of what made them viable and then they end up blowing up because they lose track of the real purpose. Mm. I think I said this to you, you're rewarded in life in, in out of proportion, it's outsized for the amount of problems you solve for others or the amount of opportunities you make possible. Mm. But it's, you're not rewarded unless you're a Kardashian mm. for just being you know, somebody attractive with an unusual body. Mm-hmm. You, you mean, you're really rewarded most of the time for making a difference. Mm-hmm. It can be entertainment, it can be enrichment, it can yeah. be wealth creation, can be self-improvement, but you're making a difference in people's lives. Mm. My next question is kind of the cheat code. It's like something that I've been thinking about nonstop the past couple of days because one of the concepts that stuck with me most powerfully 
from your teachings is the thinking outside of the box, working with over a thousand different industries. That's crazy. So noticing all the parallels and all the different combinations and all the different normalities that would be totally normal in one industry, but it's totally novel in another. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how me, myself and my listeners can expand their- Great question. Yeah, their knowledge of industries yeah, without- great. And by the way, I wanna make a clarifying. I tend to try to impact people on a much higher level of thinking. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to uh, belie the fact that if you want to go toe to toe and talk about tactics or strategy or advert, I know how to do that very, yeah. very well. But I'd rather not talk about that because that's not what's going to really produce the greatest growth mm -hmm. and expansion and enrichment in somebody's life or business. So, in answering your question, there's a lot of fun ways to do it. The first way is you got to travel outside your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. If every day you made it a point, to go online is so easy and study or review or examine anything different than what you do. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter, you know, but the more divergent it is away from what you're comfortable with. I mean, if you like technology, you know, read cooking. We used to do seminars all the time and this was the most interesting thing in the world. And I would go out, this is when bookstores existed and I'd buy a, a thousand outdated books and magazines, and we'd pre bring people, and we'd say, okay, what's your hobby? Mm. So let's say your hobby is is programming. I'd make you read a book on cake decorating. We'd send you to the room. Or if you were liked motorcycles, we'd give you one on macrame. And we'd make you go to the room and read either two chapters or two articles and come back to a group and find at least one insight in each of those two that was both interesting and could be adapted. Mm -hmm. and it was amazing how it broke people's rigidity. But I tell people do that first, number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, on a Saturday, anybody, no matter where you live in whatever city, anywhere in the world, there are hotels that if you go to, they're having conferences and seminars. Walk by and see if somebody will let you sit in for 15 minutes on something that's so out of order. Realize that reality is going on. Next is if you have friends who are not doing what you're doing, mm. take the time to interview them. Learn Socratic interviewing, by the way. Interview about what their company does, how they do it. Anybody that you know that knows anything about their industry or business, ask them how that industry works. Ask them how they sell, how they market, mm. you know, because you're going to find all these things that will expand your understanding. Just as traveling broadens your mind, mm. traveling outside of your city, outside of your state, outside of your country, outside of your continent, the more you do that, the more broad you get of understanding the differences in culture and dress and climate and topography, in morality and religion and in food. Traveling outside of your rigid business industry skill or interest level will broaden you asymmetric by orders of magnitude. I don't know if that helps. Totally. Okay. Absolutely. Thank That's you. That's what helped me. It was quite Thanks. accidentally. Right. I got started. I got married. And I wouldn't recommend it at 18. I had two mm. kids at 20. Nobody would give me a job. And I jumped around, not from job to job, but industry to industry. Mm. And after about six of them, I realized people in one industry didn't have a clue how people in another thought. As I said, most people who are just online marketers, they all pretty much try to do the same thing the same way, in the same media, the same. And everything about it is 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 really it's status quo. Mm. I was I learned how to borrow success processes from outside industries, combine them together into hybrids, apply them in totally new ways to industries that never seen them. And I was like the one-eyed man in the land of the blind. I wasn't that brilliant, mm -hmm. but they hadn't seen any of these. So on yeah. a relative basis, everyone else is doing this and we're doing this. We had tremendous advantage. Same thing with anybody here. You'll have intellectual advantage, you'll have knowledge advantage, you'll have breadth, you'll have depth. You'll be able to understand things. You, you'll see, you said you like the crazy diversity of things I do with mm. emails and everything else. I believe my job is to expand people's worldview. Mm. And not just, most of these people think it's all about them. That's very arrogant and very ignorant because most people don't have that much of a, of a life experience to be able to even be this font of, of omnipotence or brilliance. I love to introduce 
thinking totally different than what normally they would get. I'll introduce ideology, philosophy. You see me, we do fun things that I think will make people expand their thinking. And if I have somebody, if I see something that's really great, totally outside of my rigidity, because I'm marketing or business growth, I'll send it out to people or get the rights to share it with people on any anything that spans the whole arc of the human condition because we're, we're not just a marketer. We're not just, mm. I mean, we're, we're human beings, you know, we got all these other facets, hopes, dreams. We worry about our life, our money, our self-esteem, our relationship, our sexuality, our this, our that. That's all part of everybody, not just selling you this training Mm -hmm. program or this app or this whatever. Yeah. And the more you can be that way, the more powerful connection you have and the more you appreciate everybody that is looking faceless email or an Instagram account or a Facebook account. There's something behind that. Mm. It's a three-dimensional living, breathing, you know, organism with a mind and a heart and a and a soul and and issues and interests and perspectives, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah, humans connecting to humans. Yeah, it's, we very, all powerful. Want. it's very simplistic, mm. but most people don't do it. Yeah, right. It's, And that's, I think, the criticism that can come to the broader concepts that you realize all marketing or business comes to at a head. At some level, it all comes to the same principles. Humans want to feel good. Humans want to avoid pain. Humans want to fix their problems. Business is existing to fix problems and help people. And here's it's all a, very simple. It's great. And perfect. Another distinction that most people don't know. Most human beings are scared little kids trying to fake it through life. We all are. We are silently begging to be led, but there's a caveat. We want to be led by someone we feel has our serious, sincere and realistic best interest ahead of themselves. If you only understand that, mm. and you really do, there's a, a fun part of, being, of the strategy preeminence, and it talks about how most people struggle to figure out what I have to say or do to manipulatively get that sale. And it has nothing to do with it. It's how much value do you have to convey that is so truly recognized, desired, and appreciated by the other side that they reciprocate with the transaction. Yeah. Trust. It is. (laughs) One of the most clever things a mentor told me is, Rachel, money comes from other people's pockets. That's very profound. It comes from other people's pockets. So like, who do you need to be? Who do you need to show up as to be worthy and deserving of other people's hard-earned trust and time and money and energy? And that you were very blessed by having a great mentor. I agree. Yeah, that's, totally. And most people don't realize it. They should get mentors. Mm. And there's a difference. This is going to sound if you do coaching, do you do coaching? Yes. Okay. I like coaching, but I think a mentor is good to have as well because mm. he or she has been in a broad spectrum of businesses and they can hold you even to a higher standard than you hold yourself. Yes. So they know it's possible. Mm. It's and I think people need to constantly get perspective from others. Mm. They need reality checks. They have to have enough ability to to process, evaluate, balance. But if they don't keep trying to reach outside, they're limited, I mean, they'll never really grow. Mm. And it can be physics or it can be Einstein, but you grow or die. Yeah, You grow or you die, you know, you either expand or you contract. There's no such thing as staying static. And people go, oh, I want to hear that. Why aren't you giving us tactics? Everybody gives them tactics. There's no value in this interview if I give you tactics. Mm -hmm. They can do that everywhere and they can spend everyone money everywhere and get all kinds of tactics that 200,000 other people have and don't work for more than a couple of days or weeks and Mm -hmm. buy more and more. They can be tactic collectors. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) Which is a very valuable (laughs) <laughs> when it all is said and done. So when it comes to mentorship, I yes. think that that's something that I was lucky enough to be exposed to early on. I think I remember Tony Robbins talking a lot about my mentor told me, my mentor did this. I'm like, mentorship, that's different. And I've never really heard about that in school. So I went out and I found a mentor for myself, someone who was in the industry that I wanted to be in. And I interned for her for free for a year. And I learned more through that than 
almost anything else I could have done at that point. And I know that mentorship is really important to you and you spend a lot of time mentoring other people. And I also know that it's not accessible or not easily accessible to someone who's not willing to make an investment and really show up big to make it all happen. And I'm curious what you look for in entrepreneurs that you mentor, like the characteristics, the top characteristics you look for in mentors. The first is integrity. Yeah. Somebody told me long ago, you can lose all your money and if you keep your integrity, somebody will always back you. But if you keep your money and sell it, your integrity, you'll never get it back. So integrity first, directability second, a prejudice towards action as opposed to, I don't want somebody who wants to be a voyeur, somebody up in the stands. I want somebody who doesn't even want to be a red shirt, somebody who wants to play first string on the field. I want somebody who's fanatic about execution, Mm -hmm. who is not wedded to tradition, is very open-minded. I like vulnerability, a willingness to not admit, you know, self-effacing, but just to be vulnerable, to not act like you know it all and do it all. And somebody who is really, really good at feedback, telling what happened so you Mm -hmm. can help them. You can expand on something that works. You can course correct something that didn't. You can re-explain something that was misunderstood, but you can't if you don't get constant, honest feedback. And it's somebody who is driven by more than making money. Mm. Purpose, passion, possibility. I'm curious, out of all the industries that you've worked in over the past years, what has been one of the most, I suppose, like the biggest win for you in your career? If you could locate one thing, what would be the most exciting thing? Well, it wasn't economically big, but it ended up being financially the fuel for a lot of it. I had I had four or five different influential experiences. One was being turned on to a guy named Claude Hopkins who was the father of scientific measurable direct response advertising back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s when you didn't have the internet. You couldn't show breasts or or sexuality or graphics, you just had to understand the workings of the human mind and you had to be very measurable and you had to look at at allowable costs and all kind of quantification and that changed my perspective. I got introduced to somebody that you won't know about and your people won't know about, Deming, who was the father of process improvement, variability and learned that things done one way produce X, things done another way can produce 5X or 7X, same time, same effort, same, and not counting just front end, but residual. Then I was able to work with a company called Qualpro, which was the largest multivariable testing agency in the world. And they tested everything from ways you could put different cans on the shelf and different SKUs and and variations to uh, what happens when you follow up post-sale to all kinds of variations in every kind of endeavor. Then I worked for a company Uh, just as in in, in consulting for a company called Decision Quest, which is the largest litigation consulting firm in the world. And they had 150 PhD psychologists and sociologists. And I got to look at billions of dollars of tests and and experiments on everything from, from venue differential to jury selection to graphic presentation of pain and suffering if you it's almost like if you know what a forensic accountant is do you know what that is hardly probably you never will in a divorce you'll find out they're the one that figures out depending on what side they're representing whether you have a lot of money or not these people would try to figure out depending on the side they represented whether Mm. you were suffering a lot or not and it was fascinating all the different variations and ways to do it and it was just one of those lucky things and now i'm very good friends with the number one person in the world in Six Sigma, which is all kinds of different ways to make processes in a business perform much better. And I learned all that stuff. Hmm. And then I got introduced to all these businesses and I was able to overlay. It's a weird background, but that gave me the ability to look at everything and realize how many different ways you can do something and how many better ways you can do something and how many variations you can bring to bear and how to test things and and, and a point that I would make to you, this is very interesting. I was raised and grew up in a world where if you wanted to get a test-based answer, it would take you four months and cost you 
tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now you've got so many free freemium based apps that people mm-hmm. can get answers and most people don't use them. They try to tell the market, which is the dumbest thing in the world. And there's so many ways, so many variations that can make uh, quality, quantity, convertibility, average unit of sale, residual value improve. And most people don't understand that, which is really sad. Mm. It's a parenthetical comment. Parenthetical comments here, left and right. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it, I'm trying to give you yeah. answers to questions that maybe you wouldn't know to ask. Thank you. And I, yeah, these are questions that I'm coming up with a lot of questions in my mind as you're talking right okay. now, specifically about when it comes to being so driven in go, having the curiosity. Like yes. it seems like you have a big curiosity, almost an insatiable. Have a hopeless curiosity. Yeah, as an insatiable curiosity. But I find everything fascinating. Exactly. But that's what makes you like have the need to get involved in so many different things. That's true. And then it's connect a gift the and dots. A yes. I mean, it is good. But it's probably if you want pure economic wealth, you're better off staying focused on one thing. If you want a immensely spectacular spectrum of psychic Mm. wealth, you do what I do. Right. I've made billions of dollars for others. I'm not a billionaire. I'm not a pauper. Mm. But I have probably had one of the most amazing lives. I came from a background where I didn't go to college. I've been around the world, I don't know, eight 80 times. We just came back from our 22nd trip to Singapore. We were in Paris at the Ritz. We were in, we're going to Vietnam for the fifth time and I don't pay for it. And we get put up everywhere and it's a dream type job all over the world. But it's not as cool as probably owning a vertical business, but that's not the same as having a lifestyle business. Mm. I think lifestyle entrepreneurs don't even challenge themselves to their fullest potential. Oh, this is great. Okay, so my next question is, I think a lot of times what stops me from going forward as hard as I could or as, you know, really exerting myself as much as I could when I know that there's more capacity and more potential for me to work hard on something or to find the answer for something, it's this underlying nervousness or fear about of overwhelm or of burnout. And I sense the same hesitation in a lot of the people that I work with and a lot of the, you yeah, know, sure, of course. it's like, you know, very, this interesting yeah, it's a great, balance. It's an insight. So yeah. is it, what's the question? The question is, how do you personally manage the work-life balance or do you believe that there is work-life balance? I am a hypocrite. I'm going to give you an answer on how to do it, but I don't do it very well. All my life, I had three jobs when I worked for others because I had very high need and no no negotiable skill in the beginning. So work has become my hobby, and I actually mm-hmm. enjoy it. Mm-hmm. My wife would tell you I don't have anything but a lopsided life, although I have great joy and fun and very, very qualitative relationships with a diverse spectrum of interesting people. But I think the answer to overwhelm is it's unnecessary. If you know that you're playing a long-term game, mm-hmm. there's very trite but very true quotes, you know, the journey of a thousand miles starts with the first step. How to eat an elephant one bite at a time. You just say, okay, I want to do these seven things. It's not possible to multitask. What Mm -hmm. you do when you try to multitask is you do a lot of things crappy. So you do one thing first, you get it to the point where someone else can take over the redundancies and you can just move to the role that a real entrepreneur should be, which is strategist. When you get it to the point that it can be managed by a second person, you start the next Mm -hmm. and the next, and you play a long game. You don't try to throw a lot of shit on the wall at the same time because it won't work. You're not overwhelmed if you're playing a long game. You're not overwhelmed if you you have the ability to see progression, excuse the airplane, in steps and stages. And every day you look back and instead of going, I got to get all these things done, Mm -hmm. you say, wow, I'm making progress Mm -hmm. on this long-term journey there's a distinction between flash searing and crock cooking. Hmm. Crock cooking is going to last a lot longer. But it's going to take a little longer. Yeah. But the yield is going to be much better. You don't have to be stressed. Hmm. You don't have to be ineffective. You don't have to be diffused. You have free will. Hmm. <laughs> now, if you study psychology, there's a branch called Skinnerians that don't believe we have free will. I think we have free will. Hmm. If you have free will, you have the right to be frenetic, you have the right to be diffused, you have the right to be afraid, 
but you have the right not to be. Too. It's up to you, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Right. I'm curious when it comes to free will and what you just shared, what keeps you going? Because obviously there's no real urgent need as far as you might, it might look like there's no urgent need on the surface of your life. Uh, Well, there's a couple things. I'm very blessed. I'm not as young as I was and I want to keep vibrant. I am in Intimidated in a motivated way by how much out there I don't understand, Mm. including technology. I get great reciprocal joy by learning and then taking that knowledge and and playing it back with enhancements and and slices and dices and deconstructing and reconstructing. I'm fortunate that I still have viability and have been able to add value in a multitude of different ways. I get great stimulation by interacting with people who are operating at a higher level of, as I said, possibility, passion, purpose. When you see how much is like you and I are having this conversation in this room, in this office, in this building right now, but if we were flies on the wall and looked at the other offices, there's totally different conversations mm-hmm. about totally different things. If we go to a building across the street, it's that. If we go to that building over there, it's that. And they're all fascinating. And if you've been blessed, it, it, it's, it's a little bit of a gift and a bane, but when you've been given the privilege of being exposed to so much understanding, your intellect and your worldview and your capacity grows at an exponential level. So you see all kinds of really interesting things. Mm. And it's just fab fascinating. I'm fascinated with everything, everybody, in every way. It's just, I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, it's almost like you train yourself to become curious about everyone's life and what they're currently dealing with. It sounds like that's what's going on by looking in everyone's life in such a detailed way. Well, I want to understand what I don't understand. I want to appreciate what I don't appreciate. And I want to learn all the different realities that are going on because there's tons of them and they're interesting and they give you power. I mean, power comes from understanding. People don't Mm. get that. It doesn't come from how much you can spend on Facebook. I mean, it's a short-term victory, but it's a long-term weakness. Power comes from understanding. And you can't understand if you don't stretch. And people don't understand that discovering is probably one of the most exciting and intellectually stimulating things anybody can do. You know, this is going to sound a little vulgar and probably shouldn't say it because it's going to sound not sexist, but off. But but somebody said to me, and not nasty, but sex is a one time or, or short time orgasm. Intellectually, you can have orgasms continually. It's really Mm -hmm. stimulating. Mm -hmm. You get all these wonderful experiences, all these discoveries, all these insights, all these fascinating perspectives, and all those get processed in a way that gives you renewed, expanded ability beyond those of the people you compete against. So it's really cool if that makes Mm -hmm. sense. I don't know if I explained it well. Yeah, totally. And one thing that I always think about is I'm also very, very curious and I have met certain people or have people in my life where I don't find that they share a curiosity for the things that maybe I'm curious about. Maybe they're curious about other things, but I'm curious if you've found some common mindset blocks for people who want to be more curious, but they find that there's just not an intrinsic desire to learn Mm -hmm. more. It's well stated. Yes, I have. And I was frustrated at and for them originally, but you realize you can't fault human beings for being human. Hmm. And, you know, there's a reason people are where they're at in their lives. And part of it is going to sound a little negative, but most of them, that's where they want to be. Hmm. People go, oh, I'd like to lose weight. Lose weight. Oh, I'd like to have a better relationship. Then have a better relationship. Oh, I'd like to be more successful. Be more successful. Oh, I'd like to have more friends. I mean, what is... What is the thing that's stopping us is us, isn't it? Yeah, what's yeah. actually standing in your way. Yeah, and yeah. When you realize that the, we, you know, there's so much we can do more yeah. with time, opportunity, interaction, 
But I think if people realize that, you know, that the enemy, if you go into the bathroom and point at the mirror, you'll see the enemy. Mm -hmm. You also see the ally. Mm. It's how you want to view it and how you want to either, I mean, I always say that either you control your life or your life controls Mm -hmm. you. Either you control your business or your business controls you. Yeah. And uh, the tragedy that I see is most people in a business, and you see them in more of a lifestyle, they accept a fraction of a fraction of the achievement, the fulfillment, the financial gain, the impact, the contribution, at the same time effort, access, capital, uh, IP could be producing if they looked at it from a more expanded Mm. paradigm. Yeah. One of my favorite moments watching you grill someone in a hot seat of some kind was someone was saying, I don't have enough time. And you said, what do you really mean? What does that mean? And when you get down to it, it just becomes so clear that we're just not choosing to have more time. That's right. I'm not using the time. Who has any more than 24-7? Not me. How does... You know, I mean, and, and whether you like him or not, how does Elon Musk do all these things in twenty four seven, and we can't get our business going, or we can't, yeah, you know, we can't figure out how to have a good relationship, or we can't figure out how to lose weight. How does, you know, how does? I mean, it's just it's when we realize that the only thing stopping us is us. Mm-hmm. I learned this a long time ago. I've had reversals. And the good news about the world is actually the bad. If you have a reversal, nobody cares. Mm. Now, the fact they don't care if you're down for the count or whether you dust yourself off and go back in the ring and win. So if nobody cares, I mean, people care enough to go, oh, poor thing, what can I do? Call me if you need anything. But long term, it's like up to you. Yeah. But that's great. It's liberating because who cares? You know, people are afraid to... To contact people, if, you know, if they say, screw off, does it really matter? Mm-hmm. You, can, you don't even know who they are if you do it on a phone or email mm-hmm. or yeah. something. But most people aren't willing to stretch themselves in any of a number of ways, not just in business, although mm-hmm. that's the, the topic we're talking about, in any element of life, in knowledge and understanding and in interaction and listening. If people would learn how to listen and acknowledge others, and be in the moment and not be trying to cue up their what they're going to say, but really hear what others say and reflect on it and acknowledge it and think about it. I started doing something very, very interesting. After every conversation I have or any interaction I have with others, whenever possible, not always, I try to spend 10 minutes debriefing myself, which has happened because mm. our lives today are so frenetic and so... You know, so hectic. We don't even know what happened. If you say, what'd you do yesterday? I don't know. Yeah. Well, you should know. Mm. What, did, what did you learn from it? What did you like about it? What did you not like about it? What was the positive about it? What was the negative? What did that other person possess in attributes, communication, stature that you admire? What didn't you like? What mm. do you never want to borrow or, or take from that person or do? What do you always want to do? If you don't know, then 95% of the benefit of all human interaction is lost. Mm -hmm. Which is a huge waste. Seems like it. Yeah. So to top us off, Jay, and thank you so much again for your time. You're very well. You ask great questions. Well, I appreciate how deep you're going into everything and how present you're being as well when you're really drawing it from the heart, it seems. And I really appreciate that. Thank you. And there's one last question that I've been wondering a lot. Coming into your office, I've heard the word legacy thrown around a lot. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if it's a theme for you right now. It is. Yeah. I mean, what happens, this airport's a really good metaphor. So you're younger than all but one of my seven children. I have seven children, not all from the same wife, unfortunately. But I've got them spanning to 50. And when you're at the last portion of the runway of your life, you're more interested in what your life, what did it mean? What did it stand for? Will you, did you leave the world better off because you were in it? Can you find a way, same thing we're talking about, how to get more leverage, more upside leverage. If I stop now and I don't keep trying to add things that will endure beyond me, then I've basically underperformed my capacity to contribute. Mm. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I think I am a vehicle that has been given the privilege of distilling a lot of very universal 
timeless knowledge. Doesn't mean I don't know how to market or advertise or sell. I do, but I don't need to talk about that because I think my works, you know, is, you know, stands for itself. But if I understand how to help everybody be better in whatever they do in life, and I don't go to great efforts to make that knowledge available in different ways to people and try to set up ways for it to endure and sustain and even multiply by other people taking it like yourself and interpreting it, then I think I've stolen from why we're on this earth. Mm. Does that make sense? Mm. Yeah, it's, it's doing the world a disservice by not giving it. Yeah, we're here for a person. better reason than just to take oxygen out. Mm-hmm. You know, we want to put you know oxygen back in. You want to leave the world better off because you were in it. And that's not metaphysical and it's not new agey. It's not rah-rah. It's just a truth. Mm. And I think a lot of young people, if they understand that from the beginning of their career, they're going to have much richer, happier, more successful, prosperous, fulfilling, and long enduring careers. Mm. I totally agree. And I'm so grateful that you ended on that note because that is absolutely what I stand for and what I'm so glad we were able to connect on especially today, the legacy aspect of it and really thinking long-term and more than anything else, in my opinion, loving your life and living a fulfilling life. And I just am so grateful that you are here and that you're giving back like this in the way that you are and just just sharing more of your knowledge with the world. So I appreciate that. Thank you so much. I'm very flattered and I hope this uh, will have value to people who watch. Yes, and for people who are watching and listening, where can they find you right now? Where's the best place for them to get to know you? The the easiest way is to go to abraham.com. And uh, we usually, I I haven't checked it lately, but we usually have an abundance of stuff we freely give away. I think we finally added an opt-in. We didn't for seven years. We just gave stuff away that didn't sell (laughs) anything. And and, uh, we still give a lot away. But there's a lot of cool Mm -hmm. stuff there for people that really need clarity but can't really afford it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a lot of cool stuff, not just marketing, but philosophy, ideology, keynote addresses, things that will help people get a broader construct of what's possible for their lives. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jay. And for those of you who are on Instagram, he's also (laughs) real Jay Abraham on Instagram. So check him out. Thank you, Jay. Appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did find it super valuable, you just want to share it with the world. Make sure you screenshot, post and tag me on Instagram so I can stock your profile and we can connect more. And to get notified on the next episode here on Payday, go ahead and subscribe to the podcast on iTunes so you never miss a beat. Get out there, secure the bag, and I will see you next Payday.